Hej. Så. Hej, Kristoffer. Hej. Have you had a look at uh, the questions already? They are all to do with uh, the answers about monetization. Uh, how do you see monetization of APIs evolving globally? Most successful business models, number one factor. Have you seen that? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, actually, yeah, I believe I have it somewhere, but I haven't actually uh, looked into that. But I'll, I'll do that quickly now. No, 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 just uh, to give you... Uh, the, the, yeah, because yeah. I think this, if the discussion stalls, then... Um, at the... Yeah, I don't think, uh, actually, based on the experience from yesterday, yeah. <laughs> the uh, uh, moderator that we'll get uh, will actually be quite good in keeping the discussion going. Ah, very well. Yeah, very yeah, well yeah. Because I believe there will be a moderator on this call as well. Yeah, the video. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's Ellen Ellen Nape from API Ago, obviously. Uh, Anneli is uh, telling that we are live. She is listening in on us now, so we should be prepared to not say anything stupid. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can even answer some questions if someone is watching and has an, the yeah. first, the very first uh, question. We could even answer them. Yeah, before. Yeah. You know, I've even brought my software AG yeah. uh, sweatshirt with me in order to be fully corporate compliant. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. But let's just wait for the moderator and see if other people are participating as well. If you click on people on the in the right hand tab, you can actually see who's have joined on the call. So you can see that's you, me, and Anneli. And Anneli is, of course, our marketing colleague from the Nordics. Other yeah, people, of course, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Anneli, by the way. I don't think Anneli is allowed to talk. Yeah, yeah but I never, <laughs> I, nevertheless, I can acknowledge her. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think she twinkled in the in the animated GIF. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> oh yes. Obviously, I uh, thanks for the chat, Anneli. Hello. Hi, Alan. Hi, Christoph here. Hi, Alan. Hi, Thomas. So um, straight into it then, it's uh, it's a quarter past, so I think we can, uh, you know, kick things off. So uh, let's begin. So we're here with Software Agi to talk about uh, reverse API monetization. So I'm Alan Kanabe. I'm the moderator of this session, and I'm joined by uh, Christoph and Thomas. Thomas, we, we had the session yesterday as well, so some guys might uh, recognize him from there. So um, Christoph, if you want to go ahead and say a couple of words about yourself. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the invitation, Alan. Yeah, Christoph Stonadl. I'm working as the vice president for innovation and architecture at the software AG's CTO office. So one might think that this is a funny combination. Obviously, you know what innovation is. It's coming up with the big new stuff, new product, new technologies, also new customers, new partnership, 
uh, but we use the architecture part in the CTO office to structure our engagements. Otherwise, complexity will just uh, us and our, our customers actually and partners overwhelm. Uh, so I've been doing architecture for the last uh, 35 years or something like that. Uh, so that really helps in, in uh, nailing down the key questions. You know, you have functional, non-functional requirements. So that helps a lot in structuring uh, every ecosystem, not just API, by the way. I'm, I'm sitting in Vienna, actually, in, in Austria. Uh -huh. I would have loved uh, to come to Helsinki, obviously. And we, we, we do that once uh, everyone has been vaccinated. Absolutely. We do it next year, this time, like, or maybe a little bit later when the sun is shining, because at the moment there's like slush on the ground and it's not the great place to be. That's, but... That sounds like a great idea, like, like a plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll go for a beer in the summer. Thomas, a uh, couple of words from yourself. So I'm Thomas Sanson. I uh, work as a solution architect within Software AD and you can see me as the product and architecture specialist within the areas of integration and API management. i uh, been with Software AD now for a little bit more than 15 years and I'm actually based in Stockholm, Sweden, so not that far from, mm -hmm. from Helsinki. This is true. This is true. We're neighbors at the end of the day. Uh, I've been pronouncing it a German style software, AG, but do you prefer AG then? Yeah, you, you know, it's, it's, it's English, yeah. So that's <laughs> Software AG would okay. be the. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have to try and remember that one. So, guys, so um, to the audience, first of all, please feel free to post your questions in the chat and we'll try and get around to them in the end. We have some questions already that were submitted prior to the roundtable by people uh, hoping to join. So we'll go for those questions now. Um, but to kick things off then, uh, I mean, just to ask you guys the question, right? Reverse monetization, uh, what is it in a nutshell? I know that I've, I've seen the, the case with, you know, healthcare example, uh, but can you explain what it means specifically in terms of, you know, uh, the API economy? You want to go first, Thomas? Or? Yeah, I, I can start. So, so the way I see it, because of course we have been talking within the API economy about really getting paid and getting money uh, by p having people uh, using our APIs, both directly by maybe have a charge per, per API or indirectly by providing services that actually will be used and may create additional revenue for us. But we also actually see the complete the, uh, opposite with the reverse monetization. But by that, we actually mean the costs that occur when we are consuming other people's uh, APIs and really having the possibility to really taking control of that so that for example not any developer within our organization really maybe starts to use the google maps apis and goes berserk and really starts to do hundreds of thousands of requests and maybe even millions of requests uh, that we actually will at the end uh, give us additional costs and things like that so therefore we actually see it as a really important thing to really take control over the APIs that we consume as well, not just the taking control of the APIs that we are exposing. Yeah, if I if I may add, uh, actually, what we see is there are two points of uh, control, two points of where we can exercise uh, that reverse monetization problem. One is the classical API gateway, obviously, which normally you have the consumers and you charge them, which now, and at least uh, for some, like in our product, it's it's completely indifferent. We are, our, our API gateway is completely indifferent, whether it's the outside, which is um, uh, the, the being charged or not charged, or whether it's in the inside. So any microservice, any REST API, which goes over the inside uh, can be uh, funneled and can be uh, monitored and measured. So that's the API layer, microservices architecture. I think you had last, uh, uh, yesterday you had something. But we also, and actually this was uh, the start of it, uh, we come, Software AG comes from enterprise application integration. You know, back in the 1990s, you had uh, 2003 or four. you had service-oriented architectures. So you have a service bus. And one of the first examples of where we actually implemented reverse uh, API monetization was that you have in the service bus adapters which would access, I don't know, Google Maps or any payable API. So it, so we built the, the charging mechanism, the charging control point. It's a policy ex, uh, enforcement point, actually, for outgoing charges. So we, we built that into the, the service bus, into the integration platform. So that's also for the legacy systems, which might happen to fire out uh, API calls. So that's one locus 
one way where we enforce the, the reverse monetization and the other one would be the classical API gateways. We, we could even think, but I, I don't think that anyone has done that yet uh, by, by having some app mesh, uh, you know, like, like sidecars at every microservice and doing that. I don't see, I have not seen that, uh, however, yet. So this is important that it's not just for new microservices environment where you want to use that pattern, but also for old school, very large, complex IT systems and landscapes. You also want to make sure that your ERP system is not running berserk uh, with, uh, because of a programming error or whatever mm. uh, with, with uh, spending too much money on outgoing APIs. That's interesting. Can you can you kind of drill down a little bit into this then? You know how the API management um, solution can really, uh, you know, solve this problem. You know, from my perspective as an app developer uh, within a large organization, and yes, it's Google Maps I'm using. Um, does that mean that I need to, you know, go through the API gateway to to access an external service? Then is that what you're saying? The, that's our uh, recommendation really to, I would say, to take control over the, those, at least those APIs that actually have uh, a fee associated with them uh, and really mm -hmm. put the API, our internal or our gateway in front of those external APIs. Of course, you would need to, to get some help from the network team as well to really enforce that because otherwise you could always go uh, uh, in other uh, directions. Uh, and maybe just also to add a little bit on uh, what we started up with, because I don't see this problem just only with actually things like the Google APIs, where you have a fee per 1,000 requests or a fee per API call and things like that. You also have, if you look into the uh, cloud infrastructure providers like AWS, Azure, and things like that, you actually have fees based on data volumes as well. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And that could also actually uh, imply and actually get uh, fees that you didn't expect it because you have maybe, you may, maybe you have a multi-cloud strategy, so you have some applications running on Azure, some others are running in AWS, and actually the, the Azure apps to start to go berserk on calling APIs provided by AWS, or APIs that are, we are exposing within AWS, and of course that could increase a lot of data volume, and of course at the end also uh, give additional cost. And if you look into it from an API management perspective, though, then of course the capabilities that you will need to protect yourself from this is the possibility, for example, to set up different kinds of throttling rules to really uh, limit and specify that uh, it's only possible to do 1000 requests an hour or 100 requests per second or whatever. Uh, and uh, of course, all other things that could help, and I believe uh, it, one, on one of the stages here earlier today, they, talked a lot about caching and the capability of actually the API ga gateway to actually cache data responses. And that actually mm -hmm. would be a functionality that actually could allow you to do as many calls as you need, but uh, don't really have every, every call to go all the way back to the backend service provided by Google and things like that, because the data you need could well be in the API gateway as such. That's interesting. I mean, how would you, coming back to being an app developer again within an organization, if you want to access something in the outside world that requires, you know, that, that, that mm -hmm. is monetized, right? Um, how is it with, with the, the software AG gateway then? Is it so that the developer can themselves go mm -hmm. there and build out that, you know, effectively access to that service? Uh, or or does, do you see that more, you know, something that's maintained by a centralized team? I would say the governance models are critical and uh, vary from uh, the organizational complexity. If you have a very right. large uh, organization with a complex, also multi-tire API strategy, uh, then typically you, you would have uh, dedicated teams uh, of doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but it could also be if you're, if you're very uh, kind of uh, uh, tight or, or uh, coherent, cohesive uh, teams, uh, then, then it could be even one of your teams uh, in order uh, to provide uh, these services on the API gateway. I think in that case, in that small case where, where you have one role in the team uh, configuring the API gateway from the internal side and the, the developer, it's more a separation of concerns, you know, guarding, safeguarding against errors. Uh, if you have IoT devices and uh, we have uh, POCs with IoT devices where you have 100,000 devices, 
I mean, if you if by some mistake in the pilot project, everyone goes to Google or here and, and does a reverse uh, lookup, you know, this is exactly the thing. So uh, you have all the, the flexibility, typically the larger the development organization, uh, the, the more you have a, a dedicated group um, for that. Uh, but also for to access other APIs, uh, we uh, we once called our internal API. Some companies use our API gateway normally in the DM set, obviously internally, uh, and that was actually the first one of the first patterns we saw in the SOA, where you had uh, an an, an mediator and, uh, a product which was virtualizing services. So you you also the developers had a gain because the developer would call a virtual service endpoint. It's like in the API gateway and mm -hmm. uh, that gateway would then, uh, it was an internal gateway, um, uh, the mediate between different protocols or charging schemes or something like that. So, uh, yeah, it would uh, yeah, typically the larger, the more likely it is that you have an individual, uh, a separate organizational unit taking care. All right, that's that's an interesting uh, interesting path we're going down. I, I did notice that do we have a question in the chat as well. Let's have a quick look at that. So it says, um, do you have any tips for monetization models for selling data through API subscription base versus quota base versus some <laughs> other model? So so it's just like more on the other side now. Uh, yeah, sure. That's monetization. A, it's, a, it's inviting. You want to go first, Thomas, because I have a very strong answer. And, 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 and attendees typically do not like it. <laughs> no, I actually think uh, you should start, Christoph, because uh, of course I, I can see how Google do it uh, and things like that. And they typically, depending on API, they are charging by thousand calls and, and things like that. And I guess it, it works for them uh, for <laughs> for that type of product. But please go ahead, Christoph. Yeah, no, that's the easy part actually. Yeah, yeah. The difficult part is why the heck should anyone pay for your API? Why would anyone, it is, uh, in, if, if you phrase that on a more consulting-like level is, what is the value proposition you offer to the buyer of your data? We are working in, in, in Europe on Gaia-X, you know, the big data and service ecosystem. You have international data spaces and their data space ecosystem. And how many, how many uh, regarding also API monetization adoption, how many good and, and well far-reaching adoptions do you see? Actually, that's very small and very focused because typically no one, unless with the good business reasons, is, is, is really wanting to pay anything. It's the free economy. You have, you have a REST API, get it to me. And this is the, the, the key thing. You, you have to, to, to put yourself in the shoes of the customer, which business problem of the customer, which is so painful that the customer of your APIs is willing uh, to, to spend money, to give you money. Obviously, that's only one. You can also have a, another value proposition with a joint value proposition. If I take, for instance, Software AG, we have an IoT platform. And obviously, we have to pay. Uh, here is one of our partners for reverse address lookup. But if we combine that, and, and why the hell do we, do we want to pay uh, here a fee? But of course, if you have, by using the API uh, part, uh, which is costing us money off here, we can sell track and trace solutions uh, and, and A1 Digital is doing that in Austria to heavy machines because if a, if a machine is broken down like a harvester, which is very large, I, I really want to know in which field uh, that is, it's not the geo coordinates. But this is part of the large fee software which is, is or our partners actually, A1 Tell is, is charging uh, the, the, the farmer and that subsidizes um, uh, the, the API, uh, the provider. So if you, and this is Maria, uh, the, the question. So if Maria, if you want to sell your APIs and you have an intermediary, you need to think about the larger business model. So even the customers of the intermediary, what type of business problems would you be able to solve with your data and other data would you be able to solve? And this is a completely different thinking. And, and all the, is that subscription or quota based? You'll, you'll figure that out once you know is why the customer or the end customer, not just the client of your API, is really willing to pay. One of the reasons data spaces never took off was that even businesses were not prepared to pay for data or exchanging data. Right, but I mean, if if we take um, sorry to come back to to Google Maps again, they they were for 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 many years. I mean, like ten years, it was free, 
and <laughs> bang, almost yeah, overnight, yeah. you're like, what? Okay, you know, now it costs money. What do I do? You know, and you pay it because you're just so used to I'm using it, right? Uh, what, uh, did you want to, to add something, Thomas? I don't know. No, no, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, no, uh, that's a, a perfect observation that and it's typical for platform economies. So that you have a freemium model where you where you invest a long time and make everyone dependent on that model, and then you mm -hmm. take it away. It's like Facebook uh, or whatever. So yeah, right. you make it free, and then you take it away and say, oh, now it's only 100 API calls, and you have to pay. And of course, everyone uh, then uh, is, is going to pay that minimum fee because you're used to it and it's simpler than switching you yeah. need if you have enough investment and capital reserves please do that actually i'm working uh, with a partner of ours in a completely different um, uh, the business area on such a freemium model for partnership ecosystems but you have to be prepared to pay uh, to, to to fund that investment for two three four five years mm -hmm. and, and so the winner takes it all and then bank you cash them i mean it's not friendly but obviously you make money but there is a third option how to monetize uh, apis and then that would be and we see that a lot with api gateways internal we had customers of ours like uh, the, the, the dsm uh, the, the chemical plant in in the netherlands uh, which uh, they employed i think a team of five or six or seven persons who were sitting on the, in the call center and taking inquiries from their customers who had to pay something because the invoice was not correct. And can you can you explain me line item 20 in the invoice? Five or six or seven people full time explaining line items and resending PDF files. And the DSM chose to expose that part, only that part for the first, to the external world. And even I think they, they, they did get some uh, development tools so that everyone could integrate the, uh, the information of their invoices in real time and, and uh, after the invoice has been sent, the status into their systems. And they were saving six or seven people times 150K. That's a million. Yeah. So that's that's also kind of reverse monetization. It's not that you pay the actually they even they deliberated whether they want want to pay the customers something for doing that because it would save them so much mo internal money. So that's uh, the, right. the three three ways uh, uh, I think to to think of that. Uh, and it's a little bit reverse, you know, the, or, yeah. or, uh, yeah. not not mainstream. This is what I like. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So, um, well, how about well, indirect as well, monetization in terms of yeah, like yeah, strategic, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. you know, strategic lock-in of your, your customer, right? Um, yeah. Is that something that you've seen with your customers as well? I can maybe take one example there, because definitely uh, I know that one of our customers in the UK is actually National Express. So the coach provider that really runs long distance buses between the uh, different cities and things like that. And, they had a, I would say, a number of challenges. If you look at from a business perspective, it started to become really a little bit of a commodity service. Uh, of course, they did sell bus tickets, but they didn't get more revenue. It was more or less a little bit declining and things like that. Uh, and they really did see a modernization of their IT landscape and the way they did things uh, as a strategic investment to really opening up for, for new channels. Of course, uh, what they were they did go in the direction of APIs. They did build new things on top of those APIs, new websites, a new app and things like that. But of course, that didn't really make it possible for them to, to reach new customers. But what actually did was the APIs because the APIs made it possible for other ticketing uh, sites in the UK to actually integrate with National Express. Uh, so if you, for example, are looking at the, the site where uh, uh, you typically buy train tickets in, in the UK, so the trainline.com, uh, of course, previously you have been buying train tickets there, but through opening up their APIs, National Express was actually made it very, very easy for them to integrate. So whenever you search for a train ticket in the UK today, you can actually also see prices for buses and have the possibility to buy bus tickets. And of course, indirect monetization, it created a new revenue channel for them. Uh, and of course, uh, with Corona right now, it's uh, of course still tough, but <laughs> it opened up a new channel. They did sell more uh, uh, bus tickets. And of course, it also makes it possible for them to integrate with other traveling providers, so to say. So also, of course, a good, yeah, good indirect monetization case for APIs. 
All right. So I think uh, like one last question from me, and then we'll we'll start closing down. If you have any more questions in the audience, this is your last chance now. But um, my question would be: when it comes to you know designing APIs or using APIs, um, at what point should you consider monetization uh, and monetizing APIs? Um, there are there are maybe maybe two answers or two parts of, of an answer uh, to this. Uh, the first one is uh, an old um, motto of uh, Werner Vogel, um, the, the CTO of Amazon, which required back in 2003 and 2004, and you could read that in communications of the ACM at that time, that every service, which is the provider, which is the implementation of an API, uh, that uh, the, every every API, every service should be construed in such a way to be consumable, consumable by external partners. And uh, the AWS developers went furious. They said, this is crazy. And uh, Werner Vogels hired a, an army colonel in order to shoot that. Uh, now they have a service-oriented platform. I know that service orientation is no longer the, the buzzword here. It's microservices, but the autonomic deploy, the, the, the deployability and, and that you think at least, and also keep that thinking in your development that all of your functionality at one point in time will be either directly or indirectly exposed. And that requires a kind of a constant vigilance. You know, it's it's like staying healthy and fit. You need to do every day. You need to stretch. If you don't, like running for a marathon. And this is constant, a constant fight against uh, not laziness, but against entropy. You know, it's it's a little bit easier not to do it. That's number one. And the number two thing is that in the API, uh, at least from my perspective, in the API economy, you you get to API monetization late. Uh, it's not what you would start with, but you would arrive and then you need business API product managers. This is mm -hmm. like like in my answer to uh, what are tips for monetization? It was, this was a business answer. And, and IT technology would follow. So you provide the, the autonomy of the services, making up your potentially in the future sellable uh, the, the components. But then at some point in time, when you think about monetization, you need to immediately start thinking about products or services which you sell. And th that's also difficult because I find that the name API product owner is actually misleading. It's a service. And uh, if you go to hyperscalers, how much time do you think the product, the service manager of a hyperscaler spends looking at operation. How much does Werner Vogel spend on looking at operations? 50%. So it's not a product manager or like, like, you know, like a tooth, a tooth paste and, and you, you look at services and have a little bit warranties. It's continuous subscribing to APIs and making sure that the API subscribers get what they subscribe to because they will leave you because they go to another source if they can, that's difficult. So then you need an, an API service manager when the time comes and the, the, the API economy acumen of the developers or someone who is pushing them a little bit to say, hey guys, in five years, we will have a platform. And Amazon managed that. If you look at Google, that's not microservices. That's a jumble, mumble, jungle of different uh, platforms. I'm a little bit exaggerating to be more productive. <laughs> yeah. It's good. It's good. Okay, guys. So uh, we're coming to a close then. Uh, last question to both of you. It's if you had a, a number one tip to share either on this topic or business or life in general. <laughs> so, Thomas. Um, I didn't really have a <laughs> thought about that question here. Yeah. Uh, I would say, from a monetization perspective, uh, and I uh, uh, and Christopher have really been uh, talking about the, the, this already, is that I don't think that the kid, it, it, you should not start with really thinking about API monetization because I think the, the, the in most cases, actually, you will get value from, from other things, from indirect monetization. You will, uh, the APIs will cre create value in other ways, I would say. All right, Krista. I have one sentence, and this is related to uh, to architecture. And uh, the the best thing which helped me.
it is with also with regard to architecture is there is no such thing as a free lunch there is no silver bullet in software engineering not in architecture and it is always and this is the constructive piece of advice a matter of trade-offs and the trade-off is between non-functional requirements so whenever you have two or three or four architectural choices the determining factors which make one solution one architecture one way better than the others are non-functional requirements absumpt availability uh, performance security modifiability testability that's it and with those five acronyms and the knowledge that you have to do trade-offs uh like like a good um, a soldier or, or a strategist there are always trade-offs this is not if, if 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 you would do it in any case that's not a strategy that's a no-brainer i have to breathe this is not a strategy this is a no-brainer because otherwise i'm dead mm -hmm. but whether i i go in that direction or that trade-offs of non-functional requirements that actually brought me to thousands of flip chart sessions successfully <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much, guys. That was a, a very nice session. And uh, well, hope to see you in Helsinki next year. Yeah, please do invite me, Ellen. Thanks for moderating. It was uh, My excellent uh, talking to you. And uh...